Uh, time uh, for the second part of the world this week. Anne Elizabeth Mute is with us on set to review the week's news, as well as Lila Jacinto, uh, France and Katz, Lila Jacinto, Judah Grunstein, editor, editor in chief of the World Politics Review, and Laura Marlowe, Paris correspondent for the Irish Times. We've been talking about Iran. We talked about the grand jury in uh, Ferguson and reactions to that. Uh, let's talk about. Uh, French news. Uh, French voters are starting to vote. They have 24 hours to vote for the, uh, did I say French voters? I mean uh, members of the French opposition party, UMP, and they're voting for their next party president. Now, the French former head of state, Nicolas Sarkozy, is running. He is expected to easily win that election, and he hopes it's going to be his springboard for a next presidential bid in 2017. And Elizabeth Moutet, this has got to be your topic. Well, it's the topic I'm watching for The Telegraph. And there's a kind of fascination about Sarkozy because um, he lost the election to Hollande. Uh, is, not... the, is there, though, is there a fascination, I mean, here oh, in yes. France? Because the, the polls uh, for Sarkozy are not very high when, you, very... when you just exclude this particular race for the UMP. No, that's very true. No, I, I was thinking about that there's a great interest in, in, in England, in Britain, about uh, Sarkozy, partly because Hollande is not doing terribly well and partly because Sarkozy that's an himself understatement. Was, the, uh, was, the, was the caricature of the little agitated Frenchman who did things. Uh, and that in retrospect, they are wondering, well, He's doing things again. this Asterix character cannot be as bad as the one they've got right now in the Elysee. So that's, that's the interest from abroad. And the other thing is everybody is interested in somebody with sort of naked ambition and, and uh, the, the sort of uh, against the odds race of Sarkozy to get back where he was before is a very interesting to watch because if there's a second act, you know, there's not supposed to be second acts in, in, in American lives, but there can be second acts in French political lives. And th that's what he's aiming for. So I think that's that. It's true. This just doesn't happen in the U.S. When you fail once, you usually you don't try again. Well, usually no, no, now, now there was a time maybe a generation ago. Uh, Adley Stevenson, for instance, was, a, I think, a two- or a three-time loser in, in presidential poli uh, elections, but that was back in the 1950s. It's true now, and that uh, didn't work especially out an incumbent that loses, quietly retires to the wilderness and doesn't drag his party down. The thing that's, uh, the thing that's great about Sarkozy, for, uh, I, he, he's fascinating to political watchers. I mean, if you love politics mm -hmm. and if you watch yes. politics, he's, like, he's, uh, he's an A-list celebrity. You, you, he steps on stage and you watch him. Uh, and there's some, he's, he's gold for journalists. Mm -hmm. uh, he creates stories by just what he says or doesn't I see everyone say. nodding. <laughs> he, he, just, he just says an aside that probably he didn't even think of until the very moment it left his mouth, and it makes the news cycle for the next 10 days. Mm -hmm. He's just someone who has a, an ability to, to create stories, and to, for better or worse. Um, this is not a judgment on his policies or on his... And the, thing that, the thing that I was, uh, I was saying uh, downstairs before the show is that when you watch the clips from his meetings, he's, it's hard to tell whether he's a politician or a stand-up comedian or a performer. Mm -hmm. He's got this whole delivery, the way, he, the way he sort of pauses before he delivers an aside punchline that was obviously prepared. Uh, he's just a fa fascinating character. Uh, it's true that, his, that he's not terribly popular in France, there's questions whether he's even popular in the He is popular he within the party base, though. The, the 260,000 opposition party members, UMP members, they, the polls are not very reliable within the UMP, but the numbers that we have got mm. is that they're uh, very, very favorable to Nicolas Sarkozy. Lara, uh, are the Irish highly interested in Nicolas Sarkozy? I think they're more interested in him than any other French politician, but I think it's very important not to equate fascination with liking Sarkozy. I think he's someone who elicits either um, affection or antipathy, but extreme emotions in people. People love him or they hate him. And a lot of people are really kind of allergic to him in an epidermic sort of way because he, because he has these nervous tics, he's so animated, and because he changes all the time too. He changes, even during this campaign we've seen him, we've seen about a half dozen different Nicolas Sarkozy's, depending on because he changes his, his speech in function of who he's talking to. Um, I personally don't believe in the success of his comeback. I could be wrong. Um, I, I agree. So you think he takes the presidency of the UMP, right? Yes. Um, yes. He doesn't have a heavyweight in front of him, so that's, that's more than likely. You think he takes the, the, the party, but he does not become the party's nominee? 
That's right. For the presidential uh, I election? I think he will oh, try. Yes, he, will. he will do uh -huh. his utmost. Aha, oh, uh -huh. drama. Well, he will do his utmost to avoid a primary. No, uh, he's, in sold, he's sold on the, on the idea now. He's, he's now. He's, he he's admits for the moment, he says there's the going moment, to have to be a primary. For the moment. The but if his score tomorrow night is very, very high, <clears throat> if he initially. Say 80, percent, 80 plus percent, that's, like the last time he was elected. That's what his supporters were hoping for in the beginning. Now they know it's not going to be that high. But if he got a very. If, if he made 80 percent. He can then argue, look, you know, I have the, I have such support. I'm the leader. I'm the natural leader. And a primary will be divisive. You know, we don't, we shouldn't be fighting each other. We should be fighting the socialists. You know, the arguments are all there. I've heard them all already. Uh, furthermore, uh, you know, he says if there's a primary, you know, he's very worried about Francois Bayrou because if, oh, if nobody's but, worried about Francois Bayrou. No, he, Bayrou won almost 10 percent of the vote the last time. And what what could happen? The way for Marine Le Pen to get on onto the runoff is to have the right divided between, say, Sarkozy, Bayrou, Juppé. If all those people are candidates, there's no way one of them will make it to She will be in the, the runoff. The next, ba hey, listen, the next let's battle in the, the, uh, the, the, the next battle in the UNP uh, saga is who the primary for the presidential candidate would be open to. The socialists did something s somewhat mm -hmm. unorthodox. They opened the, their primary open to the entire left. So the family of the left, mm -hmm. from the far left to social democrats. Uh, Alain Juppé is arguing for an open UMP primary mm -hmm. for the family of the center to the right, mm -hmm. which would Alain allow Juppé, the Alain of course, is one of the most serious contenders uh, within this part of the primary to be the... the primary off only to UMP to guarantee that he then... Yes, but you, there is such a thing as a dynamic. What happens when Sarkozy becomes the head of the UMP, he then is going to be the voice of the opposition. So he's going to have Osmoral. the momentum. He's going to be the face of the UMP. And then he the gets UMP. the momentum. And uh, the, the question is how he's going to attack Hollande. And frankly, you know, there's, you know he, he has... Basically, he's got his plate ready for him. He can do many things. And the second thing is, he's a born campaigner, and Juppé isn't. Sure. Juppé was appointed in many things. He, Bordeaux was an entirely different situation, but he's not a hot campaigner. And Sarkozy wasn't so worried about Juppé as he was about others. I'm not. And what's the other thing is that at one stage, because, but first of all, French political, elegant political opinion doesn't like Sarkozy. The press do, do not like Sarkozy. Uh, they've succeeded in something that possibly was not at all their intention. They've made him into an outsider again, even though that man was in the Elysee for five years. So when you pit somebody like he Sarkozy now becomes against Marine Le Pen, somehow. he becomes the anti-establishment. He's the best Republican right-wing answer to Marine Le Pen in so many ways. He's using the same strategy he used in 2012, which failed, which he's basically, he's adopting but a more right -wing uh, national campaign. front light strategy which he he's going on against immigration he's talking about immigration is a threat so is david cameron yeah. britain and france are not the same country but his, his his discourse if you listen to it is very similar to the national front now he's doing anti-european discourse he's saying brussels has too much power he says he will use and adopt adopt an empty chair policy in the eu until they renegotiate schengen uh, the, so did the general the, 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 the issue but it's true these are things he has said before in in the last presidential campaign which he lost the, exactly. I, I think the situation exactly. has changed the card that juppe has up his sleeve and admittedly, he's not the most charismatic guy and he's not a born campaigner. The card that he, that he has up his sleeve against Hollande and against Sarkozy is he's competent. Yes. He's, he's like an anarch, uh, the, the cream of the cream. And of the, the polls show there is a craving for that it, it, within the French for voters. He's not, he's not, no, for well, dignified no, for a, politicians. For a competent guy who can Hollande. do the job. Uh, neither Sarkozy. Sarkozy didn't really prove that he could do the job very well. Hollande has certainly proved that he can't do it very well. You know, let's just Juppé look at the approval the... ratings for Sarkozy and Juppé, just to put this into some uh, context, because Alain Juppé, when it comes to UMP presidency, of course, uh, Alain Sar Juppé is not even in the running for that. When it comes to approval ratings overall uh, uh, for the uh, primary within the right wing, Alain Juppé, 47 percent, far ahead of Nicolas Sarkozy, just 35 percent. So that just... Uh, makes your point of how serious a contender Alain Juppé is here. He's the wise man who's going to come in and sort of elevate mm -hmm. the entire discourse and avoid all this divisive yeah. uh, and it, finger pointing and soothe everyone down. France is very, very high strung these days. Someone ironically, his soothe them down and maybe even bore them might be a good thing. His handicaps, his age. He's already 69 years old. You know, so he'll be 72. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, he'll be 72. And usually that would w work against a politician. But I think the fact is France now at the moment likes the idea of an elder statesman who's perhaps a little bit haughty, a little bit cold, someone with dignity. I, I think that's what people are craving at the moment. The, the statesperson, I 
don't like calling her that, but still, is the, who gets the most votes in this country right now, in numbers, is Marine Le Pen. So the idea that the French would like somebody who has been a member of the establishment all his life, who's a cold fish, and who has been an insider, an insider's insider, uh, and an, an avowed elitist, and that he is the best candidate to win an election, uh, I'm not buying that bit. I want to. I want to open the floor now. I want to move on yeah, from the from the UF, the race for the UMP presidency. I want to open the floor. I know all of you have other topics that you've been interested in this week. Uh, you say that the French are ready, perhaps wanting an elder statesman. Uh, Tunisians are also potentially ready for an elder statesman. Uh, Lila. Uh, you wanted to talk about Tunisia, the first round of the presidential election. Exactly what I was thinking about. 69, uh, Sarkozy, uh, the, the, the leading candidate in the Tunisian uh, election is 88. He has served in uh, every, uh, under every president since uh, Tunisia has got independence. And not, not that there have been that many. No, three of them. <laughs> but, it, but over a long period of time. Yes, and he's been a prime minister, a foreign minister, and a parliamentary speaker. Interior minister, no? Uh, foreign minister, mm. yeah, and parliamentary speaker. What this shows is the same thing of what's happening in France, too. After the turmoil of the Arab Spring, people really want stability and they want an experienced pair of hands. And why I think Tunisia is interesting is because more than three years after the Arab Spring, we, you know, the hopes of the Arab Spring, we've sort of reached a consensus that this has plunged into despair. And Tunisia has had its problems and very many challenges, but it is really the only country that has managed to keep its act going together. Uh, learning a lot of lessons from Egypt. Uh, you know, this was a presidential election. It was the first round, uh, and they're going into a face-off because there was no outright winner. Both the frontrunners are secular politicians. Uh, there was no Islamist candidate. The Islamist party, Ennahda, chose not to Which is to surprising in itself, given that Ennahda is, is one of the, if not the main political force in Tunisia. Absolutely. If you remember, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt had promised the same thing, and then they reneged on their problem, uh, their promise, and you know, e Egypt spiraled into, in, into, into that cycle. So uh, yes, Tunisia is very interesting to watch, uh, and you know, Franz Van Kat, we uh, we interviewed both the, the the leading candidates, and you're absolutely right. Well, Beji Kaida Sebsi and Mansef Mazruki. Uh, and you're absolutely right. The, you know, Enada is not was not at this election, but it obsesses everybody. Uh, it doesn't mean they're not part of the political landscape. They very much are. Absolutely. But the, the, tr uh, the, the idea and the whole question that the Arab Spring uh, put out was how are these Islamists, the so-called moderate Islamists that have been crushed for nearly 80 years, how are, you know, how are they in power? And so far, Enada has managed to be conciliatory and manage a democratic mm -hmm. process, while as in Egypt, this, this, this organization that is so old and should have been so prepared failed miserably. Now, Judah, you, you, you were reacting to what uh, Lila was saying. Well, you, yeah, did you take a particular interest in what's going on in Tunisia? Well, it's been very clear that Enada was, was watching very closely what was happening in Egypt and learned very, very clearly the lessons of, of dominating the entire political arena. Uh, and so the Islamists in Egypt, of course, were ousted by the military. Of course, right. And even if the military in Tunisia was never a strong inst institution, there was a very clear understanding that uh, uh, dominating the parliament and winning the presidency was was a good formula for getting everyone to sort of react against and to block uh, their program. So they they showed a lot of uh, a lot of political maturity. Uh, but then again, Tunisia is a much more politically mature uh, even. Even having had the dictatorship, it's a much more moderate, a much more mature uh, political culture, I think, in society than, than Egypt is, perhaps. Uh, Laura, you've been working this week on, uh, uh, so to speak, on Islamic fundamentalism or the, uh, some of the effects, the fallout of Islamic mm -hmm. fundamentalism. Uh, I have a big piece in tomorrow's Irish Times, which I recommend everyone to we'll read. We'll be reading that. <laughs> uh, I spent three hours the other night with the mother of a young Frenchman who two years ago converted to Islam. Uh, he's 22 years old now. Uh, he, when he told his parents that he was converting, uh, he got down on his knees and he said, Papa, Maman, he said, I have something to tell you. 
and his mother started crying and she said, and she said we were very tolerant open people and I wasn't crying because it was Islam I was crying because he'd done it all on his own in his corner and hadn't told us and I felt excluded from his life and he also wept and he put his arms around his parents and he said he said this won't change anything I'm still your son I still love you and so on but he started to change and he, he only ate halal uh, he refused to sit at the table with them if there was wine on the table uh, he, he'd been this young man had been christened uh, as a Catholic and but he was always looking for something his mother said he read a lot of books on religion and philosophy he wasn't one of these sort of instant internet con con converted converts. people like, where, yeah, where did his journey take him uh, well in September uh, he told his parents he dropped out of university uh, stopped sleeping with his girlfriend you know the whole the whole thing uh, in September, he told his parents he was going to Germany to buy, he became a driver after he dropped out of university. He said he was going to Germany to uh, buy a car for a client. He was going to Frankfurt. And they kept getting text messages from him. He said, I've arrived, and so on. And the mother would send back text messages saying, are you visiting Frankfurt? And he wouldn't answer that question. And then suddenly, after two or three days, he said, well, actually, the, the um, connection is very poor here. I'm, I'm going to be out of touch. He said, I told you I wanted to learn Arabic. And he said, I'm sorry to tell you in this way, but you won't hear from me for at least a month. And she said that was like a stab to the heart. Uh, and well, he was not next, in Germany. He had, he had, he had gone, gone. I see where to this Turkey. is going. He, he had, had gone, gone to Turkey. He went to Syria. He went to Syria. And the next they to heard To fight from, with jihadists there? Well, he tells his mother he's not fighting. He says he's doing humanitarian work. He's and still there right now. She, he's still in Syria. And one of the things I learned from this, which I hadn't known, is that a lot of these young French people, and there are hundreds of them, if not thousands of them, there's a parents' association that believes there are thousands of them, they are in touch with their parents. And they're communicating with their parents via email, sometimes phone calls. He actually rang his mother last Saturday um, from, from Turkey. Apparently, and, I learned a whole lot about the conditions there. They're driven around in buses. And she said it's almost like a, a, a school camping trip, except that the buses get ambushed and bombed. You know, so uh, he, he'd lost his, his French phone. He said that he was in a, dan in a combat zone, and um, he lost a lot of his possessions and so on. But he's very, very happy. At least and this is a story that's happening to hundreds of people here in France, yes. uh, people who radicalized their uh, Muslims, whether mm -hmm. they were Muslim years ago or not, whether they converted recently mm -hmm. or not, mm -hmm. uh, they radicalize, they go to the battlefield in Syria. It's happening in other European countries as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Just before we move on to other topics, what was your sense of what drives them to go and fight? This young man, certainly from everything his mother said, really believes. He really has faith. Believes uh, what? She said, he believes in Islam, and he believes that... But, but that's that what I'm saying. That's my question. Islam is not something that, that tells you to go and fight. So why does he say... Uh, why does his belief in Islam there is push him to go and jihad. fight alongside Because he jihad. believes that the, the Muslim, that the Islamic State people, who, who are considered terrorists by much of the world, he believes that they are the victims. He believes that they are under attack by Bashar al-Assad, by the Americans, by the Shiites. He talks so about So he's the going there in defense of Muslims? In defense of Islam as he sees it, yes. And he believes that pure Islam is Islam as it was lived in the time of the Prophet. Uh, and that it is a just system. And one of his emails, I, which his mother showed me, uh, he says, it's fantastic here. He said, I'm with black people and white people and rich people and poor people and there are no divisions between There's a sense of community. Us. There's certainly, he says, mm. we're all under the banner of Allah. Um, Judah, you were interested this week in a story that is somehow connected to that one. It, it, it's the um, uh, U.S. Defense Secretary uh, leaving his job over, it seems, disagreements with Barack Obama on how to deal with uh, uh, crises in Syria, amongst other things. Well, yes and no. I mean, he, in, in many ways, uh, Chuck Hagel was the perfect fall guy. Uh, after the midterm elections, uh, Obama was under a lot of pressure to make some sort of personnel change to show uh, that he had understood the, the voters had in some ways expressed themselves on his uh, handling of various, of various issues. Um, and what, what's, what was fascinating to me about Chuck Hagel resigning uh, was that uh, he was in some ways the least responsible for the policies that are being pinned on him. He was first of all hired for the job before uh, all these crises, the, all these crises emerged. And so his real job was just to bring the GIs back from Afghanistan and also to the adapt the, the Pentagon to a period of, of smaller budgets. And he suddenly found himself a wartime secretary of defense 
uh, he, he was not a policy guy. He was really a guy who was loyal to the president, gave his advice in meetings, apparently, from all the, from all the accounts, but wasn't someone who pushed policy or, or, or was he, really a, a big voice. He been a very strong opponent of the Iraq war, though. At the time, but as yeah. a senator. But within the administration, he was really a guy who carried the water for the, for the president, expressed his disagreement in private, and then carried out policy as it was handed to him. And so all of a sudden, he is fired, essentially, for the failure of the administration's Syria policy, which he was really just carrying out. Uh, I remarked to, uh, to, to, to my editorial team when the news came out that in some ways, uh, Washington, D.C. politics makes Syria look like Switzerland. <laughs> uh, Judah, I have to cut you off. Um, Anne Elizabeth Mute, we've got less than two minutes. I'm sorry to do this to you, but I know, I know this topic is close to your heart. Valerie Treviler, former French First Lady, who was Hollande bashing during her book tour in the UK. Yes, and it's very interesting because she agreed to speak to the, uh, the, the British press and she had a Princess Diana type book tour. She was interviewed by the BBC the Glamorous twice. pictures. Glamorous pictures, the cover of the Times magazine, um, an interview in my own paper by somebody else. I wrote a feature, uh, interview in The Guardian, interview in The Times. I mean, she, she does the rounds and I think she was quite wise to agree to be interviewed by uh, the British press and not the French press, because everybody in France has been falling on her like the proverbial tonne de brique. But yeah, the reaction the truth in France is to her, her book has not been good. Her book is, it's a book of gossip, but it's also a political book. She has basically destroyed Hollande's credibility with the left. And that's a very political thing to do. She says that this man is aloof, that he is not interested in the poor, that he has nasty nicknames for them. She tells this absolutely balzation scene in which, in the seven years that they were together, he only goes to to have dinner with her parents and her family once, and they live in the council house in Western France. And he right, supposedly because they're not high class enough for him. Because because they're not high class, and he looks around and he's embarrassed to be with these proles. And basically, he, he makes nasty quips about them that they're not pretty, that they're not handsome. And she writes, and you you have le cri du coeur on this one that uh, he would have been much happier with his chic friends in Paris. And later on, when he she learns that he has visited Julie Gaillet's parents' chateau in the Gers, she says, of course. Her parents have a chateau. It's not like my parents' council house and their camping car. <laughs> and that is something that I think has had a lasting effect in French politics. I think what she's saying is she says, I'm still a left-wing person. Uh, he had lost uh, figures in the polls long before uh, what happened to me happened. And that was a very interesting thing. And I think the French press have not covered themselves with glory when uh, uh, they said, oh, uh, the, the scorned women were not interested. Uh, we have not read that book. You can't find somebody in Paris who will tell you oh, I've read the book. Uh, but she sold 700,000 in three weeks. So somebody must have been reading it. <laughs> ah, the French media not covering themselves with glory. That's a recurring accusation, something we've heard before uh, coming from the uh, British press. And Elizabeth Moutet. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all our... You had the last word. I had the last uh, word. I'd like to thank all our guests for joining us on The World this week, giving us uh, their comments and analysis on the week's news. Do all stay with us. Uh, James Creedon is coming on set with us for Media Watch in just a moment. As promised, James Creedon has apparated on well, set. Yes. Um, Media Watch with James Creedon. That's what's right. uh, well, what's a buzz? We're looking at uh, the vote in the UMP party uh, mostly uh, this evening, uh, Cyril. So just to take a look at how that's playing out across the media for um, Le Figaro, I suppose they're just calling a, sp a spade a spade really here. Sarkozy is the archie favourite, the arch favourite. Um, so that's not their editorial position. It's just a fact. Over at Libération this morning, though, they were, I think, editorialising on the front page. Or is this also just a fact? Le bonimenteur, uh, in other words, the, the fibster, the con artist, it's a very strong use of language on the front page of Libération this morning, but they have done some fact-checking and have listed out 17 fibs that he told over the course of this campaign, apparently being a little bit economical with the truth about issues big and small, and it, I'm not going to go into all of them, but you can, I suppose, trust Libération to have uh, dug out all of the... Uh, moments when he has been less than fully truthful. Uh, for Bruno Roger Petit at the Nouvel Observateur, uh, the more Sarkozy lies, the more uh, his uh, the, the members of the UMP party or his fans, I suppose, like him. And for Alain Juppé, he is a hostage to the cult of Sarkozy. Now, that is actually a sentence attributed to Alain Juppé, who is, of course, uh, former prime minister, former foreign minister, and 
uh, along with Nicolas Sarkozy, the, 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 the front runner to uh, become the rights candidate in the 2017 election. And apparently, uh, according to the Canard Enchaîné, Alain Juppé said that, um, you know, he, he's hoping for primaries, of course, for the 2017 election. And if uh, Sarkozy takes over the, uh, the leadership of the party, I think Juppé is worried that that may not happen. Uh, but he has said that it is almost like a cult, uh, uh, this following of Nicolas Sarkozy, and that, he, you know, maybe he won't have his place in the UMP party anymore if Nicolas Sarkozy takes over. I'm sure over. he'd like to have a cult following. All right. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, Fr uh, François Bayrou, the centrist leader, uh, says, well, if there has been uh, some... Um, perhaps untruths being told, this is a strategy that is perhaps efficient for Nicolas Sarkozy to take over, uh, to take the helm of the party. This is François Bayrou's uh, point of view, no fan of Nicolas Sarkozy, I think it's fair to say. But the flip side is that it shows the French people he hasn't changed. So that's his reading of things, uh, that it could work to get him the leadership of the party. But actually, in terms of the, his broader appeal, uh, we've seen that perhaps he isn't quite as, as different as he may have been in the past in terms of uh, how he's, you know, projected in the media. Uh, meanwhile, that uh, that reference to him being the leader of a cult uh, attributed to Alain Juppé, one tweet here is saying that this is the link that you should uh, go to Derive Sect, which is, of, of course, the government body uh, in charge of keeping cults in their place. Uh, that is obviously completely satirical, but it is a nod also to the fact that this is a, an electronic vote and uh, indeed some uh, expressing the concern that... Uh, this could go wrong, as it, uh, as indeed the, the last internal vote in November 2012 between Coppé and As Fion indeed did. it did. It's something we followed here on France 24 quite right. closely, and we'll be following this vote at the UMP very closely as well, taking place right. over the next 24 hours. We should get the results Saturday evening, French time. Thank you very much. James Frieden so. with Media Watch. Uh, we leave it at that. Another edition of World News on France 24 at the top of the hour.